So the name of the program that we deliver here is the Environmental Technology Program. It's a two-year diploma program. It's delivered over 21 different courses, a total of 60 college credits. And the aim of the program and the goal of the program is to develop made in Nunavut environment practitioners. The program's been running since 1987, so last year was actually our 30th anniversary. We have well over 150 graduates of the program now, and these graduates have found careers as environmental practitioners all across Nunavut, uh, both in federal and territorial governments, but also private industry, in the organizations, institutions of public government that are uh, described under the land claims agreement, they're everywhere. And it's really great because the more alumni that we get that are out there working, we rely on them a lot as a program to come back in and teach for us and that. So they're a real strength of the program. So I don't really say we're a, I, I know the, the, the name sounds a little deceiving. It's called Environmental Technology Program. Uh, years ago, when our program was last reviewed, there was a suggestion to change the name of the program. And I was really dead against it because we have such strong alumni. And I felt that a differently named program might make some of those alumni not feel so much a part of it. So we've kept the name. Mm -hmm. We are not the MIT of the North or the Caltech of the North. Where we're not a pure technology type program. Uh, we do... Learn, the students do learn um, about some technologies for sampling in northern conditions, especially in cold northern conditions. But I tell people we're more like a, a soft science type program. And the range of programs or the courses that we teach are, is really broad. So we do everything from applied math, the very beginning, the introductory ecology, to fisheries and wildlife management, marine biology, limnology, uh, GIS, we have a GIS course, small engine repair, survival skills on the land, a whole broad sort of selection of courses. And the idea is to do as much as we can for as many of the partners that hire our students. So, you know, when I, again, when I talk to people about what we do, we're trying to create, we're trying to train in a room for careers as environmental practitioners. And that's sort of a broad group, of course, uh, of um, uh, opportunities from being a wildlife officer and an environmental protection officer, a wildlife, sorry, a um, lands officer, um, technicians for their uh, various institutions of public government. So it's sort of a broad spectrum. And I tell people that after the two years, I don't know if the students are fully trained for any one position, but they're well trained for a slew of positions. We run sort of a typical college format. Classes start in September. Um, the first semester ends before Christmas. We start our second semester in January, goes till the end of April. So two semesters per year, about 15 weeks per semester. Um, the first thing we do in our program is the students have their field camps. So they come back from the summer, and the first thing we do is we sort of pack up and go camping all together. Uh, first year students, their, their field camp is more or less introductory field camp skills. So a lot of our students have camped and gone hunting their whole lives, but it's a little bit different when you're doing field camps with researchers and government organizations. There's certain protocols you have to follow and risk assessments you have to do. So we try to take them through that, how to plan, how to meal plan, how to purchase things, how to pack things when you get there, how to set up so the camp's going to be run safe, safely. Um, you know, how, how do you balance chores between the camp members, stuff like that. Um, so the field camp's a great way, especially for our new students, to sort of get to know each other. And it's a real benefit that our program has, I think, over a lot of programs is that in those first couple of weeks, our, our students bond in a way that is very difficult for other programs to bond. They also do their wilderness first aid training, firearm and firearms training at that time, um, basically to prepare them for all the other land trips we're going to do and field camps we're going to do. It's important that our students, you know, have that wilderness first aid training and firearm skills in, in case there's any and, uh, issues with, with uh, predators or animals. Uh, when they come back, we 
do an introductory ecology, specifically to northern tundra ecology. And then they go into things like math, communications, and another course called Office Procedures and Management Skills. First semester, is, um, it gets off to a good start, but it's, it's a difficult semester to get through, I think, for a lot of students. It's, in many cases, first year back in school. And so our goal is to get them through that first semester and let them remind them that, you know, the second semester gets more specific into uh, work related to environmental studies and technologies and that. And yeah, we've certainly had elders come out uh, this year, we did invite somebody out, didn't quite work out. Um, we do have our technician who is a local gentleman, lots of land experience and hunting skills, graduate of the program from years ago. So he comes out sort of to fill that role. We have various people that come in and out of camp throughout the week. Uh, all three instructors here and our technician go out. We also have usually a marine biologist from one of our partner agencies that'll come out. We'll also have our wilderness uh, first aid instructor come out. I don't think we've ever, I just think, I don't think a student has ever stayed back because we were unable to accommodate them I can. So we have the majority of the field gear for students, um, but we do ask students to have, you know, their basic clothing. It's ideal if they have their own sleeping bag um, and then toiletries, cutlery, things like that, but more or less all the cooking stuff, all the food, sleeping mats, foamies, caribou skins, tents, you know, all the fuel for the heaters and stoves, all that stuff's provided by the college. We do have stuff here for students who are unable to sort of get it one way or the other. Um, we've done that. I don't think we've ever had a student not come out of camp um, because we couldn't work with them. We've had one or two students over the last 20 years not make it out, of, out to camp simply because they showed up the day of camp and then told us they didn't have this stuff and we couldn't do anything. If they gave us advance notice, we've always been able to find them sleeping bags, clothing, stuff like that. Yeah, getting to know the students for sure. I think, um, you know, being in a field camp uh, setting with students is a great, like, we're really fortunate as instructors because we get to see our students and a different light. We get to see how hard they can work when they need to work. We can see how they work under poor weather conditions because we always have bad weather while we're out at camp and how they respond to that. We can sort of pick up on those that are a little bit more outgoing and, and good at interacting with others and those that are shy and get to know the little ins and outs of their character and personality. Um, a little bit even maybe in their preferred teaching style or learning style. Um, so I think just getting to know the students, people are asking, you know, what, what's the best part of your field camps? It's in the evenings playing cards and playing games and listening to them tell stories and jokes and the laughter. Our instructor tent is set up next to the large sort of communal tent. And uh, it's just great sometimes going to bed and you hear them mm -hmm. laughing and laughing and just getting to know the students and, and getting to know that, you know, these are real people with complex lives, just mm -hmm. like you and I have. Many of them have partners and kids. And I, in fact, I, I told all the instructors and they would back me up on this. Um, I tell them it's very important for our students during this camp to get their wilderness first aid training. The second most important and almost equally important is that they have a great time and they get to know each other. Mm -hmm. And it's sort of like sending the hook and now they don't want to leave, right? Now they'll put up with some of the, some of the courses that they're not so enthused about being here for, like communications and office procedures, but we sort of let them know, you know, there's an, another field camp coming up in April when the weather is nice and we have the skidoos and there's snow. Yeah, yeah so we start and end each of the two years of the field camp. So over the course of the program, they do four field camps, two in the fall, two in the spring slash winter. Okay, so our fall camps are, I think, probably typically late fall weather for a lot of Southern Canadians where at night you might get a little bit of um, ice on the streams. Uh, it's cold, certainly goes um, below freezing. Up here it rains a lot or it can rain a lot. This year we had more snow than we have ever had and our field camps always take place the same week every year. So it's not that we were late. 
we just had more snow. I think it snowed uh, about midway through the camp and uh, that snow stuck around for the rest of the camp. So we had an unusual amount of snow. It's not typical. It always snows at least one day during the camp, but usually it'll melt over the next two. So it's, it's right around freezing. Some years we get more sunny days than, than cloudy and rainy, um, but a lot of years we get cloudy and rainy. So, um, you know, learning how to manage that and learning how to ma um, manage your, your attitude too when the weather isn't so good, um, it's an important skill for our students too. Just learning to get along and um, not letting the, the weather dictate your mood and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a range of growth depending on the students. So some students come in here you know, like the first couple of days, I realize, yeah, they're going to be a great graduate. They've already, they're a mature student, a disciplined student. Um, they're going to not probably struggle too much throughout the program. They're going to be a great graduate. And then some students, they come in and you can tell they're not necessarily right from high school, but they're, they're still young, you know, young in spirit. Um, maybe they haven't had the opportunities to um, develop certain, I don't know, parts of their character. They're maybe not so independent or resourceful. And it's those students who we often see. And I think as an instructor, I, I love seeing by the end how confident they start to get. And they realize that they are a good learner, um, that they're resourceful. and. Uh, the end of the program isn't necessarily the end of their, their, their either education or learning because they realize they have the tools and, and they have the skills to continue on as learners, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I love seeing that sort of maturity. I love hearing students say, my goodness, I, I look at the work that the first years are doing and I think that was hard for me. And now, like, look what I'm doing in my final semester, look at some of the projects we're working on, look at some of the courses and, and they get it. So there's that sort of awareness that, um, yeah, they're, they're really capable learners. They've got that confidence to learn. And, and they're, I think one of the big words is resourcefulness. They know they can, you know, if, if they don't know how to do something, they're confident in their ability to learn it now. So, mm -hmm. so I, I should give a little disclaimer. I'm a graduate of the program, right? And uh, so a lot of the graduates of the program, um, I end up being sort of close with because we're all alumni, uh, sort of friends with, we keep in touch. I have an alumni list, we keep in touch. We're really fortunate, a lot of our alumni, when they're in town, will visit the program. And uh, I've certainly heard phrases like life changing. I've heard a number of our graduates say, greatest choice, greatest decision of their life, I changed their life, changed the whole direction, how much they love their careers, how, you know, how grateful they are that there is a program like this around for them to take a program that gives them an education that leads them into careers where they're not just sitting in a cubicle. They can go out on the land and mm -hmm. interact with um, people in their communities, interact with elders, interact with researchers, interact with other government people. Um, yeah, they just, I really get the sense that they love it. And uh, I know many of them have really exciting jobs, you know, working for some really great organizations on some really great projects from the new Canadian Higher Tech Research uh, Station over in Cambridge Bay. We've had students go on and work on icebreakers and, and research vessels and on glaciers. We've had them work for most of the institutions of public government, most of the Inuit orgs on great projects, projects that need Inuit on them and leading them, right? Uh, but not just Inuit, but Inuit that can speak that the language that some of the proponents are, are, are talking and, and sharing and using and, and students that are educated enough to know what seems to be working, what seems not to, and, and can sort of interact and, and talk with, with researchers and uh, some bureaucrats on a level that I think a lot of people who wouldn't take a science course like this would be able to. So okay. we just, I just met with one last week, actually we were in, uh, it was for a basically community consultations on oil and gas development in Nunavut. And so they had QIA at it. They had, um, 
uh, the old Ayanak or Cyrenac was there, uh, who were also Syracuse, Cyrenac, uh, government of Nunavut, ED and T was there. And uh, they had, so they had about 10 different representatives from 10 different levels of government. Three of them were graduates of the program. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And I think the only, the only technical people, or only people there that had technical knowledge and were Inuit were the three graduates from our program. So that was exciting for yeah. me to see. I was just at an Arctic Net uh, Iris report release last, uh, I think it was Wednesday or Thursday night. And um, one of the people hosting it, another graduate of the program. So our graduates are all over, you know, leading the way as environmental practitioners. And um, I think being great role models to younger kids realizing, wow, we can have these jobs in the future. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we, we, we can do this. And these are jobs just for, for Southerners, right? That these are jobs that they can go to Arctic College and get a diploma that'll set them on a course where they can have careers in these exciting these uh, exciting areas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think one of the biggest challenges is just um, the level of education that the students come into. So uh, I think we've done a good job as a program communicating this to some of our employers and letting them know that, um, you know, we almost start in our program at square one. We expect very few math skills. I mean, you have to have basic numeracy for sure and almost zero science skills. So we don't have students come in with, you know, um, you know, the grade 11 and 12 academic science courses or grade 11 and 12 academic math courses. So we, we realize that in many communities, these courses aren't being offered. So we try to accept strong students, students that have shown strong academic skills and then do what we can, as much as we can, over the two years. So that's how we're dealing with that. Obviously, past historical traumas um, to people in the North are sadly plentiful. And I think if you first come up here from the South as an educator, you see people driving F-150s, new skidoos and new boats and living in fancy houses and, and wearing, you know, whatever the fancy shoes are for the day and with their iPhones. And, and I think all that stuff can, can hide from you the fact that there are still these traumas that are intergenerationally impacting uh, Inuit up here for sure. Mm -hmm. And um, I think those it, have, have caused a lot of students a lot of struggles. Um, I think um, cause issues regarding um, homesickness. Uh, substance abuse issues, um, just a lot, just a lot, you know, that, that puts a lot, I, I couldn't even fathom, you know, over, I, I've been in it for a long time and I've read so many things and sometimes if I sit down and think about all the various things that have happened to um, the people up here over the last 100, 150 years, it's flipping overwhelming and, um, it's very hard for us as, as instructors to truly understand on a day-to-day -day basis what our students go through and the things that they're dealing with. Um, dealing with them in their day-to-day -day lives, but also dealing with an emotional and uh, mental health um, basis too. And, um, you know, we, we try to remind ourselves of that. I try to remind the other instructors and they try to remind me that, you know, the most important thing last night may not have been for them to answer the 20 questions that we gave them, mm -hmm. that they may have had some serious stuff happen at home. And we need to, we need to understand that and um, really work with our students and be empathetic, not make excuses for them, but be empathetic and, you know, and, and accept where they're at and, and help them be, be a small part of that. I don't know. I tell people this all the time too. I don't know. Uh, all the answers to some of the issues that are in the middle of it. But I know part of it's education. I don't know how big of a part of it is, but I, I truly believe um, that a good education can boost self-esteem, help people, and set them on a good career track and change lives. I've seen it. I've, I've seen it in students who come in here and I've seen their lives like, take off after the mm -hmm. program. And I'm not saying it's just because of the program, but it's the program's been a part of it for sure. Mm -hmm. 
this is one of those questions where sometimes I feel if you want to know what indigenous education is, I think we should let indigenous people define that. Um, if you were to ask, I mean, is indigenous education, I think most people, if you ask them just simply what it was, they would say, well, it's teaching indigenous people about indigenous stuff, right? Their, their way of, of, of knowing the traditions, the ecological knowledge. Um, but I think it can also mean for programs where that isn't the primary goal and that isn't the primary goal of our program. I get a lot of people that apply uh, in the springtime and they'll be like, yeah, I want to take ETP because I really like hunting. And I was like, well, you know, in my head, I'm thinking, well, that's great that you enjoy hunting, but we really don't hunt much in our program. And it's, it's like 1% of our program. That's not really what we do. Um, it's, I would be stretching it to say we are an indigenous education program. I think though, as an education program, we have, we've had many successes with indigenous men and women. So I think there's something that works in the program where Inuit men and women from Nunavut to have done well in our program and they've enjoyed their time in the program. Um, so some of the things there that I think might cause that is that I think we're very open to um, our learners sharing any knowledge that they have. Mm -hmm. um, and it could be knowledge of, of a very local nature. It could be knowledge that they've read. It could be knowledge that they've heard from, you know, their un uncle Peter Lucy or something like that. Like we really, and we really welcome and value mm -hmm. because over the years we've gotten some really great little nuggets. We also try our best to be very welcoming, accommodating, understanding, I think one of the, I think because I have certain little, I call them couch passions, right? Things that I do are armchair passions. And one of the armchair passions I had even before I moved up here was art, the Arctic and the history of the Arctic. Not so much the ecology of it, but the people, um, the traditions, the exploration, the development of it, the peopling of the Arctic, right? So how did the Tunic get over here and how they people and how did the why did the Thule follow so, so long after and why were they so different? And I'm very interested over the last number of years with the influence of, of Vikings, right? And so I've always been really interested in this stuff. And um, I think when I moved up here though, I started hearing more of the colonial past. I think having a really good understanding. Now I have a good book understanding I have no experiential stuff in this, right? But I have a really good book understanding. How does that help? I think it may, gives us a healthy sense of empathy. And it certainly slows down your judgment of things that maybe don't seem quite right. And I've heard this, obviously I'm a white guy, so other white people often speak freely to me, not realizing that I'm not really where they're at in how they think these things. And, some of the stuff they say is just really simple-minded, judgmental, way too quick. As you can tell, they just, they don't have a clue what's been going on here in the last 150 years. So 150 years. So I think that helps me, I think, as an instructor. I've had great bosses too, supervisors, I should probably say. They hate it when I call them bosses uh, here at the college that have worked here for years and years before I even came here and have given me really great learning points, I guess. I guess one was when I very, when I first started teaching, I wasn't teaching here, I was teaching a, in a small community up island. And I was like a week or two in, and I was getting a little exasperated by the fact that my students weren't really showing up on time. Uh, they, they didn't seem motivated to learn. And I remember I was talking to my boss and I was explaining this to her and she goes, do you realize, Jason, that for some of your learners, just waking up and getting to your learning center is an accomplishment. For a lot of them, that's where they're at. Just 
be glad that they come. And, and when they're there, do whatever you can with them when they're there. Don't worry about whether they're there at the full schedule time, but just do what you can. And sort of those things that sort of set me, I, I guess, um, maybe set me straight and kind of gave me a different perspective have been extremely um, helpful. I, I think just getting to know my students too, it's just the other thing. It's a small town. Or regardless of what people say uh, about Iqaluit, for me it's still a small town. And uh, we bump into each other all the time in the communities, in the community. And it's important for the students to see me also as a member of the community. It's important for, them, for me. Um, to me, it's important that they see me with my, my, my wife and my children. And they see me doing other things. And in the community, I'm a community member. And they know not to ask me about homework. I will never ask them about their homework. They don't ask me. And it's just sort of the importance of getting to know each other on a personal basis too, and not just as a student. You know, I've heard people say, well, down south, you know, if you go to a big university, you're just a number or something, right? You hear this a lot. That is totally not here. I mean, we really do. We get to sort of care about our students. And of course, there's some students that you care about more than others because, uh, quite frankly, maybe they need more caring than others. And some, you know, have good supportive families here. And, you know, just before you came, um, I actually had one of the first years come and share something that's going on in his family. And I was really grateful he did. Because now we'll, we'll get, you know, if there's some things where maybe he's, not focused in class or maybe his assignments are a little bit delayed, which is uncharacteristic behavior for him. Maybe we'll get it, but it's, it's nice to be able to get to know your students like that. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna give you a broader answer and then I'll focus on the program if you don't mind. My broader answer would be this, that technology allows for the academic development of curriculum across the bit, so that there is more emphasis on the math and sciences. Not, um, you know, I, I don't think it's, it's a, uh, uh, what do they call that, sort of a game theory where it's, you know, if one area wins, another area has to lose. So the fact that we put more time into math and science does not mean that we put less into language, uh, you know, need to do language development and cultural. It, it, that's, we got to stop thinking that way. But there are so many exciting careers that are completely lost to, to youth in this territory now because too often they're not given the very basics um, through the K to 12 system to move forward in a math or science field. Those STEM areas of science, technology, engineering, and math, right? And those careers are going to be some of the most exciting careers. They're some of the most exciting careers now. In the future, I just I think they're going to be even more. And I think a lot of those careers, I think what's really exciting about them, a lot of those careers don't need you to be in a specific place. With technology and the internet and video conferencing, the way collaboration goes on in the world today, you can actually have one of those careers sitting in, in, in Repulse Bay. You can have one of those careers sitting in Kimmeru or Clyde River, right? As long as you have decent internet, you can do this stuff. You can do coding. You can write things. You can collaborate in projects. You can design. You can engineer. And uh, I hope none of it starts seeing the importance of those STEM areas and really starts pushing it. Because I think, like I said, our youth are sort of being lost to a lot of these. And I don't see enough people graduating with them. And I know just from the students that come into our program, there's a lot of work to be done there. So that's overall in the program. And this isn't just my vision, this is the vision that the college has. And I think it'll happen much quicker than the next 10 years. I would say, I would be shocked if this doesn't happen in the next three to five years. Um, I think the ETP program will continue to exist. The reality is our program, um, after two years, has graduates go on to exciting careers in industry um, still needs ETP grads. So ETP grads are still gonna be needed. But 
our industry partners are saying that there's other careers that currently can't be filled by ETP grads is they need a, a bit more training. They need a degree. Say that's the minimum requirement. So the college does have a short slash medium term uh, plan to have a post diploma option for our graduates to go on to do a Bachelor of Science. And that's what we're going to be work, starting to work on very soon. Actually, I should say, you know, we've probably exchanged some, some information already moving in that direction. But this year, we should really be starting that process. And uh, I'm very hopeful in the next two, three, maximum five years, we will have a post-diploma Bachelor of Science program. Um, that'll be delivered primarily here in Nunavut, maybe not in this building, maybe not in the Kelvin but that graduates of the program, uh, current graduates and past graduates, all that those alumni that we have, if they wish, can continue their studies and get a degree, a science degree. And so I'm really excited about that. I'm also excited though um, to strengthen the program, to continue to strengthen the environmental technology program. I think as uh, the technical skills of, of students coming in the program seem to be getting better and better. We can strengthen our program more and more. As population grows, as the number of uh, applicants grows in our program, how we can be more selective and sort of just up the program little by little. I've said before, and I think, I think it's a pretty accurate statement, that the academic skill level of my classmates back in 1996 um, isn't what I see in the students today in 2018. So that there's been, the bar has been upped. So there's higher entry requirements or the typical incoming student is uh, more academically skilled. Okay. Is there anything else you would like to add? Can I see the questions just so I hopefully they can edit this part out? Is there something I so thought of? I've, yeah. I've wrote on the ones that you discovered. Basically, you've covered all of my questions. <clears throat> yeah, so a lot of your questions I noticed too were almost written more for indigenous mm -hmm. educators or so. As you can tell, I'm probably not an indigenous educator. Uh, I don't think we'd ask this question. I mean, like overall, you are an educator, and you have been for a long time, so. And I appreciate that, but I also appreciate my worldview is completely different. Mm -hmm. And although I wish I could understand certain things better, um, and I think I, I try to, and I try to reflect on this stuff, I, I, I'm never going to have that she, uh, shared life experiences that so many of my um, students have. I was fortunate early on, Claire, because I was supposed to teach in a different program here that was being developed at the college. And we had a very wise um, dean at the main campus at the time. And he says, you know, Jason, the program might take about a year to get funding for and everything. He was in the meantime, though, we're going to send you to a small community and you're going to learn what it's like to live in a small community and the environment that your students, your future students are going to come from. And I spent two years in Clyde River, just north of here on Baffin Island. Unbelievable experience. And you wouldn't believe how many times that experience comes into my mind when I'm dealing with students. And yeah, it's, uh, I was really fortunate to have somebody give me that opportunity. Oh, you, you, there was a question about um, success of the program. What, 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 where is it? I don't see it here, though. Um, um, so, because that's where I can brag a bit about the program. We have, we really do. We we have a lot of alumni, and those alumni have been picked up by our industry partners. They move up, you know, the, those corporate ladders. They do extremely well. We have. Um, <clears throat> we have had people from 
ADMs all the way down to, you know, wildlife officers to and it's sort of like the GN corporate ladder. And uh, it says, you know, how, how do you know the program's been successful? As a two-year program, I don't think there's any program in the college for a single delivery program that gets as many applicants as we do. We get 40 to 60 a year. Uh, our graduates, most of them, have jobs before they even graduate. And um, our, the employers that hire them meet with me, us, all the time, and are asking us, how do we get more? How do we get more? How do we get more? How do we, you know, when you're only graduating maybe six to 12 a year, and you have all these different agencies trying to get them, they're competing for them. So to me, you know, you can use all sorts of different uh, measurements to, to measure the success of a program. My success, the graduates go on and speak well of the program, employers speak well of our graduates, and people keep applying, and in huge numbers, so, yeah. Is that all for today? Hmm? Is that all? Yeah. Okay. Just stop. So we did four.